I just want to announce one more time, if you are on the church's Wi-Fi, could you please shut it off? We've had some difficulties back in the back with the live feed, and if you're on the Wi-Fi, please shut it off. Thank you. Let's go ahead and stand up on our feet this morning. 
Look at the words. The time has come to worship the King of Kings. Are you ready to do that this morning? Amen. Whether we have good Wi-Fi or we don't, we're going to worship Him anyway. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we welcome you in this place today, God. Have your way. Move in your people today, Jesus. You are welcome. You are more than welcome in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. You fight for us today, God. You're our defense. And we thank you for that, Jesus. No matter what the enemy throws our way, you go before us. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength. Though my heart is weak, you only. sword and shield I'm not teeth out this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're faithful, God. Through the hard times, 
through the good times. You're faithful, Jesus. Hallelujah. I am holding on to faith. Because I know you make a way. And I don't always understand. And I don't always get to see. But I will believe it. I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shape prisons and walls I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt It's all 
about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. You know, our songs, he can hear, the world can hear, the outside, the world can see it, but he looks on something that the world can't see, amen. And that's the heart today. Give it to him this morning. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, Jesus, all I have is yours. Every single Bring it to him. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. Search me, Lord. I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made When it's all about you It's all about you because you are there in our hearts and you give us the song to sing. You give songwriters the songs to write because you're in their heart and life, living in them. And today, Lord, the greatest thing that we can give to you, which is more than a song, is ourself. And today, Lord, we desire to give you all of ourself to you. And if there's anybody here today that hasn't done that yet, first of all, in being born again, coming into a personal relationship with you, Jesus, we pray today will be their day. We pray that this will be the service where your spirit goes forth to their heart. And the word of God will touch them in a special and a powerful way. And your spirit will convince them that there's no reason to wait another day because today is the day of salvation. Today, right now, is the accepted time. And so as you deal with them, Lord, may they respond to you and may they give all of themselves to you, not holding anything back. We thank you, Lord, today that salvation 
is a free gift received as we repent of our sins and accept you by faith to receive your atoning work at Calvary in our own personal lives. But we go on from there, from the time of being born again and realizing that we have entered into that aspect of being a disciple, a follower of you, Lord, and that to be a disciple is not free. To be a disciple will cost us everything. It'll cost us some time, effort, energy, reading the scriptures, prayer time. But these things should not be something we don't look forward to because as we do these things, as we discipline ourselves to do spiritual disciplines, it helps us to grow more and more in you and be more and more like you so we can touch the world in which we live because when this service has come to a close and we all leave this building there's a work to be done outside of these four walls and that's because we're disciples of Christ and that we carry the gospel with us so help us to be sensitive to those around us this week in Jesus name and today, Lord, we pray for this service. God, that you would have your divine way. God, that you would touch Pastor Vance as he brings forth the word of life. God, that you will touch our hearts. May we be enriched through the word of the Lord. And may each and every person here today, when they come to the time that we leave this place, may they say, oh, it's been good to have been in the house of the Lord. And... When people walk past Pastor Vance and shake his hand on the way out today and they say things like a great message or how that touched me, how that blessed me, all of that's wonderful. I've been there. I've received those kinds of compliments and we, th we thank the people for those. But Lord, I really enjoy when people go by and rather than saying, oh, you don't know how that blessed me, to hear somebody say, to the man of God or the woman of God, oh, you don't know how that changed me. Because that's what it's all about, being changed and going from glory to glory. And so, Lord, today we ask for a change to come in our hearts and lives today where there's a change that needs to be affected God and brought about that you would do that work by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God today. And we pray for our one today, Lord, that one that we've been praying for, we continue to pray for. And if there's a person here today that doesn't know what we're talking about, that we just have decided, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us to pray for one person in particular that needs salvation, that needs to come to the cross of Calvary, and, Lord, allow their sins to be washed in the precious blood of the Lamb of God. And so today we lift up that one today. Pray today. I lift up him today to you in prayer. Lord, you know that through the week we pray for many other people, but today, Lord, we call out that name of that one today, that man, that woman, that boy or girl, that uncle, that aunt, that relative, whomever they may be, that spouse that may not be a Christian today, may not be a disciple of Christ today. Lord, touch them in Jesus' name and let your spirit move in their hearts, bring them to you. The same way that we've all had to come to you is through the fact that your spirit brings a convincing, a conviction to our heart that we're not saved, that we're lost in our sins, and we need you, the Savior of the whole world. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you for a moment as you're seated. It's good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to wake up in the morning and be able to put your feet on the floor, right? That's a blessing. Even with some of our aches and pains and different things, it's still good to be able to get up in the morning and thank the Lord for another day and to be able to uh, live for Him and enjoy life. There's a lot of people not enjoying life right now, but God wants us to enjoy the life that he gives because it's an abundant life in so many different ways. And we are all blessed to be a blessing. I was thinking about that. It's been out a while now, the song they 
just talked about and saying, you know, I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. And it is all about Him. In everything that we do, it's all about Him. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about Him. Sometimes people say, well, I don't like that song. Well, it's not about you. Hello. Uh, I, I didn't like the the volume or I didn't like this or I didn't like that you know it happens in church all the time been around a long time it's happened in the church a long time it still goes on but what we have to remember we have an audience of one and that's who it's all about and that is Jesus Christ and I know that uh, Pastor Vance probably feels the same way I do that when a service has come to its close what we desire as ministers of the gospel and what you all should desire too is Lord were you pleased were you pleased with the praise and worship today were you pleased with the way we entered in and that we did not disconnect when it came to be offering time tithe and offering time that we didn't disconnect because we realize it's not all about me, it's about you and how obedient and faithful we are to you. If there's anything about us in that regard, it's about our faithless obedience to him, but it's all about him. And so praise and worship has been powerful, it always is. We find that to be true. We see how people enter into praise and worship. And I know that sometimes the, the Wi-Fi thing can be or the internet thing can be a, an obstacle. I don't know. Some of you may not remember this, but I should remember when we didn't have anything like internet. Until someone in particular who I'll leave nameless gave um, himself credit for inventing the internet. You know who else doesn't remember the internet? What's that? Where's Brother Mike Summers at? Bring him in here. Mike Summers? Mike Summers. Guys, go get him if he's out there in the in the foyer. <laughs> Little birdie told me today that somebody, where's he at? He's coming. <laughs> he's he's you know as we get older we get slower. Amen. There's the birthday boy. Hey, wow. I believe it's tomorrow. We were talking about the internet, brother Mike, and I know you don't. You sure remember when we didn't have internet, right? way back when. Anyway, it was told to me that I'm, it's your birthday, so you, you can't blame me for this one. But can we all just turn around and see Brother Mike? Aren't we appreciative of Brother Mike Summers today? Yeah. Yay. He's going to be 19 again. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. good. I didn't know where Brent was going with that at first, but <laughs> that's good. Happy birthday, Brother Mike. And anyhow, I was thinking about in the days when there was no internet, how things went. You know, there's a lot less stress with that than what we have today, you know, and try to put everything out there so people can enjoy the service online and too, and that's wonderful that we have these various avenues where we can uh, minister to the community, but uh, it'll all come together. Um, but today, right now, we want you to understand that you don't disconnect right now from praise and worshiping God as we praise and worship Him with the tithe and with the offerings. As our ushers come forward at this time, would you just say right now, lift your hand and say, Lord, I thank you that you've blessed me with health, with strength, Yes, with finances, you've blessed me with a wonderful family. You've blessed me to be able to live in this country. And now, Lord, I thank you for all your blessings. 
and I am blessing you today and I am blessing the church today because you have blessed me to be a blessing. So as our ushers have come forward today, God, we pray that you would bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. And those that may be here and have such a desire to give, but maybe they have nothing to give, well, that's not totally true because, as I said a while ago, they have themselves to give first and foremost. But I pray, Lord, you'd make a way for them also to enjoy the blessings of giving with finances into the house of God, into the kingdom work. And we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. God bless you as you worship and praise the Lord in giving. of KCOG this morning. Our announcements for this week, first of all, is we uh, want to welcome all of you that are here and welcome those that are watching online. And if you are online and, and it's working, uh, then we ask you to maybe, you know, click the like button, make a comment, uh, share, and uh, be a blessing uh, to others as you are being blessed uh, there wherever you are watching. Um, unto others ministry, our ministry to senior care facilities in our areas where we have some singing, devotion, and prayer for the residents uh, once or twice a month. Today, they'll be meeting at Hickory Estates at 2.30 p.m. And uh, so if you're interested and, and are able to be a part of that, and you have any more questions, um, it says to uh, see Gail Brookins and uh, find out more about that if you'd like to be a part of that. And um, you don't have to go every time, but whenever it's possible, you'd like to be part of that. Baptism, rebaptism, membership, July 28th after the service at Jim and Penny's Lake House. I was going to get up here this morning and kind of put a little funny out there and say baptism, rebaptisms at um, Shelbyville Lake next Sunday. Just to see if everybody's awake. Because <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> you know? Or Lake Springfield, something that you just you know wouldn't be said. But it's the Jim and Penny's Lake House, 3 p.m. And to give everybody a chance to have lunch, um, you know, you, you can arrive early as well there. But uh, there are some places to eat along the way. If you want to eat in a shed, you can go to Pawnee. Uh, if you want to eat at Crickles, well, that's also in Pawnee. Or the truck stop at 105 and 55, Tony's. And the subway at Farmersville. The places in your heart, including Whirl Whip and the uh, restaurant at the Oak Hills Golf Course Clubhouse. And then also, after the baptism, we will have celebration with cake and grilled hot dogs. So remember that, and uh, be sure that you get with those that you need to get with. If you haven't already, uh, let them know that you plan on being baptized or rebaptized. And we were talking the other day about people that uh, attend church services and water baptism time and God begins to move upon them in a service and they feel like so strongly, man, I've got to get baptized today. Maybe they've never been baptized or maybe they want to get rebaptized, and I've got to get baptized today. And I've been a part of services like this too, just in the recent, you know, last few years where people have come and they didn't have baptismal clothes, they didn't bring a towel with them or anything, but they went on and got in that line and they read off their name and uh, they, they ended up being baptized in water, and they went home in their car soaking wet. So there you have it. Uh, it's very, very important to follow in the footsteps of Christ and to be baptized. Um, does it save you? Remember that. It's just water, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And after you've become a Christian, been born again, we need to be baptized in water. 
World Mission Study Class, Sunday, August the 4th, begins the, the new class from uh, 9 to 10, and the focus will be upon uh, various aspects of world missions, and will be, of course, taught by Pastor Vance. And how many believes Pastor Vance has some uh, knowledge, <laughs> wherewithal, to be able to teach a good lesson on world missions? Anybody believe that? Yeah, amen. Well, you ought to. You ought to because they've been around and been in missions for many, many years, world missions. Uh, also, the Midweek Connect restart of the service will be Wednesday, August the 7th, all classes at 7 p.m. And then Pastor Vance and his family are going to be leaving for vacation uh, after the service. Uh, <laughs> oh. I guess it'd help if I'd look up at the screen every now and then, but I'm trying to keep with the notes here. I got that's good. No, it's not too far. I can see it. <laughs> I might not be able to read it all too well, you know. Not, I don't have my bifocals on or my regular glasses, but I like that. That's that's good. Um, but we're missing Carrie. Are you staying home? <laughs> oh my goodness. I like what he said, too. Who would ever believe that you'd go to Michigan for a vacation? But uh, Michigan is a beautiful place, and around the lake's a beautiful place, and all of that. Uh, I've only been to Michigan, I think, once when I was young growing up. My mother had a relative that had a, a golf course up there in, um, uh, they even mentioned the name of Michigan the other day on so watching TV. I can't remember the, the name of the town. I was there once, so don't hold that against me. But I can't remember the name of the town. It'll probably come to me sometime at the end of the service. And it won't matter a bit. It really doesn't matter now. <laughs> it doesn't really matter now. It's just, it's just the fact that they owned a golf course and I was too young to golf. I didn't get to go up there when I started golfing, but anyhow, that's the way it goes. Um, if, it, if anything comes up uh, while they're gone on vacation, and you, you need my wife or myself, uh, don't hesitate to call. And uh, if you don't have our number, um, be sure you just get with us after the service, and we'll give you our number. You know, some pastors don't like to give out cell phone numbers, but if I don't give you my cell phone number, I have no other number. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we're glad to give that to you if you need us during the week. And, of course, in case of an emergency, capital E, emergency, uh, they would be able to be contacted but let's make sure it is an emergency because they need their time with their family because general assembly is not a vacation camp meeting is not a vacation a lot of church members sometimes believe that it is but it's really not you're in services a lot you're in meetings a lot and things like that so um, this is a, a much needed vacation for them our memory verse today Proverbs 16 and verse 9, 9, not 9, 9, but 9. Uh, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Look at that one more time. Let's read it out loud together. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. We've all been there, haven't we? We've planned, made plans for this, that, or the other, but it is the Lord who establishes our steps. Sometimes I've planned things and God shut the door and I didn't get to do what I thought I was going to do because God establishes our steps. A man preached a message many, many years ago and uh, I, I probably, I know I have forgot exactly the text and forgot the exact message and how it went that he preached. I don't have it on tape or anything like that. But the title, there's just some titles that I never forget. And I have never forgotten this title. And it's probably been, it might have been right when we went into the ministry in 1981 that I remember hearing the, the message and the title. Or it could have been before I went into the ministry. But I've never forgot the message title was this. You may get what you want, but you may not want what you get if you leave God out. A lot of truth to that amen knowing what the will of the lord is and walking in the will of god as pastor vance is going to come we're also asking for the children to come at this time and to be dismissed to children's church 
Children's church is not a babysitting area. Children's church is exactly what is called children's church. It is church on their level. <laughs> on their level. Stretch your hands toward the children of KCOG today. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for these children. We praise you for their parents. We praise you for their guardians. We praise you, Lord God, today that they're in the house of God. There's a lot of children that don't know anything about going to church. They don't know anything about uh, the Lord. They don't know anything about children's church or v VBS. But we thank you, Lord, that these children are being brought up in the ways of God. And as the scripture has told us that if we will train, especially on the parents' behalf, it's not up to the church. The church comes alongside to help. But if parents will train up their children in the way that they would go, should go, that when they get old, they will not depart from it. And so as the church today, we want to help parents to see that their children or their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren have a good Christian up upbringing, a good Christian education. And so today we pray that you'd touch them through the word, through their fun times, and, and through prayer time, and that your spirit would just move in children's church today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. If you've ever watched 2010, The Space Odyssey, you know that. But if you don't, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's all right. Uh, I just want to say, I mean, I'm not a person who, who tries to do this too much, but my dad always told me, give flowers to people while they're alive. And I just want to say how much I do appreciate uh, Pastor Austin being with us. It has really taken... Uh, an unnecessary stress off of me. I was always really worried, okay, I can't get sick, I can't get hurt, uh, because I, you know, I, 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 there's been times in which I came to the pulpit and perhaps maybe I shouldn't have as, as illness was there, and now that, that worry is gone. Now God can get me as sick and hurt as he wants. Uh, but it is, just, it is just a relief. And, and, and also, too, just uh, despite that we, we are, you know, different, uh, that we complement each other and how the kingdom works, and I'm just so I'm so grateful they're here. And someone told me at the funeral on Friday, that's the nicest woman I've ever met, and or someone told Carrie, the nicest woman I've ever met in my life about Sister Terry. So, uh, so now we know we have the nicest woman in the world in our church. So, yeah, so, but we're so grateful they're here. I also do want to thank everyone who helped uh, with with uh, memorial service on Friday and and took your time and uh, how you know churches can't minister to families at times like that without so many people dedicating their time and I, I just want to say how much I appreciate that. Okay, of course today we're going to continue the book of James and I do want to appreciate you know Brent and Jeremy for putting the background to match my shirt today. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I didn't notice it until I was looking up there like hey that looks like my shirt. I don't choose my clothes, so don't worry about it. Uh, but we're going to talk about how to plan biblically. This will be the sixth sermon in chapter four. We'll have one more. Uh, next, next Sunday, uh, Pastor Austin will be preaching, but in two weeks we will uh, finish up chapter, uh, chapter four of James and then move into chapter five. But let's pray our prayer as we enter the word of God together. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself with your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me for Christ's sake. Amen. And again, we pray that because as we enter the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, as we study it, as we hear it, we are encountering Christ. He is the Word made flesh, and we need to always be willing to hear His voice through His Word and to be transformed by it. So if you have your Bibles, James chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 13 through 17. It will also be on the screen. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, 
If it is the Lord's will, we will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now, as we look back on what we've talked about so far in James, we can see that the direction James gives us throughout this letter is very practical. It is a very practical letter. I mean, it has deep theology. It has so many things, uh, promises and warnings to us. But at the same time, it is very, very practical. And, and that from the very start, the Holy Spirit has inspired James to write in such a way where God places his finger on certain aspects of our life that is so clearly in need of his attention and in, of his correction. Now, in the verses that we just read, we again come to some very clear, practical instructions in regards to how we are to plan our lives. And once again, God seeks to place his divine finger, his divine touch on our hearts and our lives. Not to condemn us, but to reveal sin within us so that we may repent of that sin and thus draw closer to him. So that we will move closer to his purpose for our life, closer to his will for our life. Now in these verses, James speaks again to all of us, but especially to those in every generation who grasp tightly to their daily schedules, their daily calendars. Those who have their whole lives planned down to the second always running here and there, getting on a plane at the last minute and then jumping up as soon as the wheels touch the ground as if the universe depended on them making their next meeting. All of this in creating the impression that to everyone who sees them that they must be incredibly important, always busy, and cannot possibly go a few minutes without being in some sort of contact with all the people who desperately seek their attention. Where in truth, probably many of those people wish they would just get on a plane and keep flying forever so that they would never have to hear from them again. People who cannot place, cannot put their phone down for a moment. I'll pause there for a minute. Because they might miss a text as if whoever was writing them must hear back immediately or the universe will come to an end. People who always want to remind you how busy they are and thus how important they must be, that their lives and their calendars are full without too many moments to spare, not just for today, but for the week, for the months ahead, for for the years, how incredibly busy they must be, that their whole lives are mapped out and they have a one-year plan, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan, and they're always willing to share their detailed plans for their journey through life. They do this in business, they do this in family, and sadly, too often, we do this in the church as well. Well, James has a word for such people in the church. Remember, his letter is written to Christians everywhere, in all times, in every place, including to us today. Now, if you think I'm just kind of taking shots at people who plan because I don't plan, you would be wrong. Uh, this was my life for many, many, many years. And it was actually James in the the verses that we read that spoke into my life that transformed me forever. I used to, I used to plan my entire month in 15 minute segments, 15 minute increments for the whole month, always busy, always in a hurry. Nothing was more important than time, especially whatever was next on my agenda. I remember I went to Lee and I took 26 hours a semester, finished a four-year degree in two and a half years so I could do what was next. I went on itineration from church to church to church as missionaries throughout North America, but always in one church I was thinking about the next church so that I could raise whatever I needed to get back to the next place that God wanted me to go. When we lived in Croatia, we were planning on moving to Germany to teach in the seminary there. When we were in Germany, we were moving to Dubai, and we were always thinking of what is next, what is coming, what is before us. I look back at those times with so much regret because I was never fully 
in the moment. Because I was always thinking of the next moment, the next task, the next meeting, the next person. And even now, I struggle to let my mind stray into what might be in my future or what is next in my life or next in my ministry. I truly seek, I truly want, I really, really do want to live in the moment now, to stay here now. But everything in our world, everything in our culture, everything even in the church's systems itself pushes us to be anywhere other than where we are right here, right now. It is so easy to become a slave to all this, and the consequences are very, very easy to see if you look around. Divorce is rampant through our country because husband and wife, they may live in the same home, but they don't really even know each other. Christian divorce rates are no different than that of the secular world. Pastors are often absent from their families and from their marriages and from their wives. Missionaries are no different. They're always going and doing something. Many of us hold our phones in our hand more than we actually hold our wife's hand. Maybe what we should try is putting our phone in our wife's hand, and then maybe we would hold her hand a little more often. We have divided families because we don't spend any time together. And even the things that we do that we call being together are anything but actually being together. We have sports and vacations, and sometimes we're even in the same room, but no communication going on, no connection. We have rebellious teens, rebellious children who are being raised by televisions, phones, internet, social media, where their friends, those in the entertainment industry, those sports figures and other people in the world speak more into their life than their own parents and much more than God himself. The church is declining numbers because people are too busy doing other things than gathering together with God's people as clearly directed in, by Scripture. We don't have time for worship. We don't have time for the Bible. We don't have time for prayer. Church is no longer a priority in our life because we're just too busy. We give countless hours of our time to everything and anything other than God, and then we wonder why our marriages are empty. We wonder why our children are distant. We wonder why our finances are in disarray. And even no matter how many possessions we own, no matter how much money is in our bank account, how many clothes in our closet, we just have no lasting peace and no lasting joy. We're lonely, we're empty, living for the next moment instead of the moment right here, right now. And by the way, that is the only moment where you will find God, right here, right now. Too many of us think, oh, in the future, I will search for God and I will find God. Or, or tomorrow, I will start doing this or doing that. I will start reading my Bible and start cultivating a relationship with God. But the only place you're ever going to find God is right here, right now, in this moment, wherever that moment may be at any particular time. And how many of you, be honest, don't say it out loud, because I really don't want to be that discouraged before I go on vacation. How many of you right now, as God, as God is speaking to you through his flawed servant, are thinking about where you're going to eat after service? What you will do this afternoon? What you'll do this week? And then you sit there and you wonder why you don't hear from God anymore. Why he doesn't speak to you, why your life is, isn't different, why there's no joy, no peace, why your children are lost, and yet your mind is far from this moment. Now if you think just for a second, because I'm a pastor, I am not tempted in the same ways you are, I'll be honest, you have no idea what you're talking about. I know many people think that we only work one day a week, that we have an easy life. Taste my life for one day. And now, you cannot do that unless God gives it to you. But we're always thinking about the next service, the next meeting, the next sermon, the next series, the building, the you know, Christmas, Easter, the next event. Then we're wondering what God has planned for our children, our family, even our own future. 
Now, I know many, people, you know, many pastors will talk about that, but then you know, they only will consider a move that financially benefits them personally. You don't see many pastors moving to smaller churches. Now, I can say this, and I think I can say this with God searching my heart. I sincerely desire to be wherever God wants me to be, no matter what that means or where that means. If he wants me to be in Kincaid for the rest of my life, great. If he wants me in North Korea, fine. But please understand, not only do I have the same temptations as you, but as pastor, I also have to carry many of yours as well. If I'm not very, very careful, I will constantly be thinking about other people. I will constantly be worried about you, your marriages, your children, your security, your careers, your spiritual growth, and oh yeah, your eternity. Now let me say this, James is not addressing the issue of planning versus not planning, okay? Planning, in most instances, is a good thing. It's a good thing. I remember my first day of missionary orientation with the Church of God. They make the statement, plan for your future because we're not going to. (laughs) It was a very encouraging day. And then they showed me how to do my taxes, and that was also wonderful, but. Now, James is not condemning making plans. James is condemning and confronting the danger of presumption. He is addressing our tendency to act, live, and plan our life and our activity without reference to God. Or we leave God out of the equation altogether. Planning our lives without considering God's purpose and God's will. I remember when I was a young boy, church was not optional. And I didn't grow up resenting the church because of that. I grew up thinking the church is the center of my family's life and nothing comes before it. And I can't say that was a bad thing. Whatever your plans are for today, this week, this month, this year, career, retirement, even vacation, have you included God in all of them? Have you thought about God's will for your life? Not what you want, but what he wants, what his purpose is for your life. Why he has you in that job that he has you in. We just read a verse, our memory verse, that he orders our steps. Do you think you are where you are by your choice? Why does he have you there? What is his plan? So for today, just right now, let's stay in the moment. Let's look at these verses And let's hear God speak to us in the right here and the right now. So how to plan biblically. Number one, and if you you do the note sheet, this is number one. Don't be presumptuous. Don't be presumptuous. And what are we getting to here? We're talking about God's omnipotence. What does that mean? He is all-powerful. He can do everything. There is nothing that our God can't do. Now, I know we sing it, but I'm not so sure we actually believe it. Our God can do anything. You think if God didn't want to change your circumstances, he couldn't change your circumstances? You don't think he could open a door to a different job or a different opportunity if he wanted to? God is all-powerful. He can do everything, and you and I can do nothing. Congratulations. You graduated from Bible school. That's what you learn when you go through seminary. I can do nothing. God can do anything. And it brings us to James in verse 13. He says, now listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Now what James is referring to is, is, is the making plans on the basis of our ability. That we are making our plans independent of God. We're doing it on our own power, on our own ability, not on God's power and God's ability. The emphasis here is we. We will do this. We will achieve that. And there is the absence on the will of God and on the absence of dependence on God in those statements. When we make plans based on our will and our ability, we lack the humility in recognizing how frail we are, how unable we are, how outside of God, Jesus made it very clear, we can do 
nothing. But we lack that humility because we are prideful. James is addressing our tendency to be self-motivated instead of being God-led. To being self-sustained instead of being God-dependent. Being self-made instead of being God-transformed. And then James starts that verse with, now listen. Now if you want to look at that in the Greek, it's, he's basically saying, wait a minute. Stop right there. Ultimately, give me a break. Give me a break. I mean, there's a bit of, in the, in the Greek, there's a bit of sarcasm there in what he says. It's basically saying, now listen, you who say blah, 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 is what James is saying. Now remember back in chapter 1, James has already hinted of the ridiculous notion of us hungering for earthly wealth and profit that does not extend past eternity. He tells us in chapter 1, verse 9, this is not on the screen, believers in humble circumstances are to take pride in their high position. And then he tells us those who are in high circumstances should, should be, be humbled by our low position. What does he mean by that? That if you're poor, you should consider yourself in a high position, and if you're rich, you should consider yourself in a low position. And you think, wait a minute, James, are you like all mixed up there? Don't you have that, you know, reverse somehow? But remember we talked about keeping an eternal perspective when it comes to possessions and wealth. That if we have an earthly perspective, we will not think properly about things. And then he tells us that we will pass away like a wild flower. Now he doesn't infer that poor people won't pass away, but what he is saying is they are lower to the ground. They're lower to that area already. That's why Jesus warns us that it's so difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven because they often get distracted and have a greater tendency to think from an earthly perspective, trusting in their own wealth, trusting in what they possess more than they trust in God. I know many people who have struggles financially who often wish they had wealth. But don't, don't you see what James is saying? You really want that? That with it comes the possibility you're going to trust in that more than you trust in God? That you want more things in your life that are going to take you away from Christ or have a tendency to take you away from Christ. When I meet people, and they, you know, when we were traveling around as missionaries to different churches, people are always asking me, you know, what is, what is the worst thing you have to do? And usually what's the worst thing you ate? And then, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But you want to know what the greatest thing about being a missionary was? About living overseas in places that are dangerous, in places in which you're in a church like this, knowing that at any moment someone could walk in the room and blow themselves up or you could be arrested or whatever it may be. You know what the greatest blessing of that was? Being 100% dependent on God. And it had nothing to do with my spirituality. It had nothing to do with our faith. We didn't have nothing else to trust in. We didn't have anything else to be dependent upon. I mean, we were halfway around the world in places in many times in which the majority of the people wanted you dead anyway, trusting that God would move the hearts of grandmas and aunts and uncles and other kind of people way back in places who barely knew us anyway to remember to put money in an offering plate so that we could eat and live and survive. Knowing that at any moment your life could be taken. And if you called the U.S. Embassy, you would probably get an answering machine. If you think the U.S. Embassy, if you think you travel around the world, and, oh, my embassy will be there for me, think again. So we trusted God. Why? We had no choice. It was great. And again, it's not my spirituality. It's not my great faith. I didn't have anything else to trust in. It was all removed. And it was such a wonderful thing for my finances, for our safety, for our health. I remember one time uh, when Leander was a baby, I think she was about eight or nine months old, she got really, really sick, and we were in Croatia. And she had a really, really high fever, and we were, you know, we were, we were praying, God, you got to heal her. And then finally said, so we got to take her to the doctor. And we took her to the doctor and said, she's really sick, and she's got a really high fever. And he took his face, and he put it up to her head and says, yeah, she's got a fever. You can take her home. 
No medicine, no shot, no nothing. And we thought, we need to pray more. And we prayed more. And she got better. Now, I'll say this. There are missionaries in which their children have died in the same situation. But you had to trust. The removal of the other things was so beautiful. And I'm kind of learning the same thing as a pastor, but in a different way. More than anything in my life, you say, Vance, what do you want more than anything else for Kincaid Church of God? Do you want a new building? Do you want a bigger office? Do you want a, you know, a, a Mercedes in your parking spot for Pastor's Appreciation Day? I'm not throwing hints, okay? No. More than anything on this planet, I want you to grow in Christ. Now, you may not believe that, but that's the truth. And you know what? I can't do nothing about it. I can't make it happen. I can't. I can plant. I can water. Every week I can set the table, but I can't make you eat. Only God, only God brings an increase. There's nothing I can do about it. I want the church to mature. I want the church to reproduce. But I can't do nothing about it. Do you know that church growth is not my responsibility, but yours? It is not my responsibility as pastor of this church to do ministry. My responsibility is to move you to do ministry. Now, as a Christian, I have that responsibility, but not as the pastor. I am supposed to equip you for ministry. Sheep beget sheep, not the shepherd. For a church to grow, you have to go to the highways and the byways, to the jobs, to the families, to the neighborhoods, and tell them and preach to them and proclaim the gospel and the good news of Jesus. But the emphasis in verse 13 on this statement is that we don't make a reference to God. We don't seek his help. We don't seek his guidance in our plans. We don't rely on his strength or what's being done for his glory. Now again, this is not a statement against financial success. It's not a statement against making a profit. I know people have tried to make that out of James, but that's not what he's saying, not at all. It's a warning. It's a warning for those who think, tomorrow is in my grasp. I control my future. It's in my hands. If you think that, oh, you're sadly mistaken. You're sadly mistaken. So, number two. The second thing, admit our ignorance. Oh, we love to do that, don't we? Admit our ignorance. Now we're talking about God's omniscience, that he knows everything. God knows everything. He knows what you did last night. You know, it's funny, I can tell what you did last night because some of your heads dropped. <laughs> he knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're thinking next. He knows what you're going to have for lunch, even though you ain't looked at the me menu yet. He knows the day you'll breathe your last breath. He knows everything. And guess what? We don't. We don't know. God knows everything, including the future, and we don't know it at all. James reminds us in verse 14 that we have a very big problem when it comes in regards to our planning. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are missed. That appears for a little while and then vanishes. You got big plans? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. There are two absolute certainties, absolute certainties about the future. Okay? One, God knows the future. Two, we don't. Those are absolute. God knows what you're, you're going to do tomorrow, and you don't. You may think you do. The future is unknown, and that cannot be denied. What does tomorrow hold? Now, you might have a plan. Will it rain? Will the sun shine? Sure can't trust the weatherman in Illinois. I've learned that. I mean, I used to think, well, they can't, you know, surely they can't get it right two or three days in advance. They can't get it right 12 hours in advance. And I've seen the guy on TV. He looks 12. So... Will your flight be on time? Will you have a car problem in the morning? What will the economy do? 
Will you have coffee? Or will your spouse drink it all? Will you die tomorrow? None of us, none of us know what will happen. And knowing that and accepting that should do two things for us. This is also in your note sheet. Number one, it should humble us. It should humble us that we don't know. Once more, we see the emphasis and the essential need that James keeps bringing up of humility to think and act in a way that is pleasing to God. He's already told us that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. He's told us to humble ourselves before the Lord, and he will lift us up. We, over the last two weeks, we've talked about slander and being judgmental, which are pure arrogance and a lack of humility, the opposite of being humble. And then here, he's telling us another expression of arrogance is making plans without reference to God. It should humble us that we do not know the future. Now, I mean, in, 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 as a missionary and in our life, you know, we, we flew a lot. Flights get canceled. They get canceled. Luggage is lost. You know, one of the things I've always found fascinating, anytime I've been anywhere, and this is anywhere in the world, where a flight gets canceled, there's always one person usually with a phone or two, usually, you know, you know, you can usually tell there's some sort of businessman or something who gets really, really angry because the flight was canceled. And they rant and they rave and they take it out on the little girl behind the desk as if she controls the weather in Denver. Another example I've seen is people go to the store and they don't have what you need. They don't have what you went there for. And you rant and you rave and like the cashier is in charge of the shipping industry. The preacher preaches a sermon that offends you like he wrote the Bible. <laughs> oh, you couldn't, I've been waiting to say that one for a long time. <laughs> but our anger and our ranting of these simple things expose our arrogance our pride in our lack of humility. Every time our imp impatience and frustration with such things rears its ugly head, it speaks to the same thing within us. One clap of thunder and a flight is delayed. Will we go? Will we spin? Will we carry on business? Will we make money all blown away in a moment? Not in our control at all. And that's what angers us is that it's not in our control. God raises his little finger and all of our plans are shredded to bits. Now, if we would learn from it, it would humble us because it would tell us that we're not in control of very much at all in our life and only an arrogant fool would think otherwise. So, number one, it should humble us. Number two, our, our ignorance of the future may help us. It helps us. Our future is hidden from us, ultimately, for our good. It is good that you don't know about the success you will have in the future. Why? Because it would make you like a peacock. You'd fluff up your feathers and walk around. And, hey, let me tell you what's going to happen to me in the future. Tell me that ain't so. And then not only that, but then we become unhappy and disgruntled with the things the way they are now because we have to wait for it. We would be discontent with our life now if we knew, oh, oh next year things are going to get really good. And you're like, oh, I don't want to wait till next year. Remember, Americans are the only people in the world that stand in front of a microwave oven and shout, hurry up. But also it's good that we don't know our disappointments in the future. We don't know how we will fail how we will fall. We don't know what we're going to lose. We don't know about our upcoming heartaches, sufferings, illnesses. What advantage would there be in knowing that? God knows. It's very, very important for us that we can actually rejoice in our ignorance of the future and God's knowledge of the future. For ultimately, the reason we want to know, I mean, let's just be honest. Let's look, let's look deep within. God search our heart. Ultimately, the reason that we want to know the future 
is because we desire to control it. Meaning, we actually want to be God. Because God is the only sovereign in the universe. And our desire to control the future is our desire actually to be God. And not knowing reminds us that we are not God. That we are not in control. And it makes us angry. Anxious and frustrated. And because God knows and we don't know, we should trust an unknown future to the God who knows. The God who controls. And the God who loves. All things work for the good of those who love the Lord. You think, you don't know what I'm going through right now. You don't know how much it hurts. No. All things works for the good of those who love the Lord. What is that good? Making us more like Christ. Let's think about the desire a little bit further about the future and our desire to be God, to control. Why do we want to know? Because if we think if we know, we could control. If we knew what the doctor was going to say, if you knew what the, the, the medical report was going to be next year, you think you could run a little bit faster, eat a little bit better, and change that outcome. You want to control it. Why do you think tarot cards, horoscopes, and palm reading is so popular? Why do you think there's so much popular false teaching, false prophets, and false prophecy in the church? Satan knows our weakness. He knows our evil desire. Now, let me just say this. When it comes to that kind of stuff, tarot cards and horoscopes, not for a second, not even a little bit, do not stick your finger in that kind of stuff. Stay as far away from that as you possibly can. Don't go down that road, not even for a minute Please don't do that. And if you doubt me and you think I'm just you know, being overly serious and, and don't know what I'm talking about, open your Bible and see what God has to say about such things. We have too many people in the church who are dabbling in that kind of evil. So what have we learned so far? We've, we've learned that we can't do nothing. Okay? We've learned that to presume to know about the future is foolish because only God knows that it should humble us, but it also benefits us, and that our ignorance of the future is an absolute 100% fact. We don't know, okay? Because if I knew, I'd put a whole lot of money in the stock market <laughs> if I knew what was going to happen. But every little report comes in, like, oh, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, and everybody's just freaking out all the time. Why? Because we don't know. But number three, we should recognize our bre brevity, our brevity, only God is eternal. Time is passing. You and I are a vapor, a mist. Verse 14, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. A mist, a vapor, only for a little while, then gone. I don't know if you guys remember, you know, several weeks ago, the eclipse. You had to remember it. Everybody talked so much about it. You know, we ordered the little glasses from Amazon or wherever you got them and, and all the talk and all the hype. You remember how long it lasted? I do. I remember trying to fix my camera so I could take a picture. And the time I got my camera fixed, it was over. <laughs> as quickly as the flower dies, the mist disappears. The clouds blow over and such is our life. And the older we get, the faster it seems to go. I mean, when I think that I have been here for three and a half years, it seems sometimes like just a few months. When I look at my girls, 18 and 16, I'm thinking, what happened? You were in diapers yesterday. No, they weren't really, okay? So don't, don't think that about them. Right? I mean, even if we live, like, I mean, like Doris, 101. What is that in regards to time? I mean, I said in the in Sunday school class today, Doris would have been in Methuselah's youth group. <laughs> and it's with that knowledge, James asks us that question, the question. What is your life? 
What is your life? You may be in church this morning because you are asking exactly that question to yourself, and yet you have no answer. I don't know what I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going, and I sure have no idea. I mean, I have no idea where I come from, and I have no idea where I'm going. You see, this question, what is your life, is such a vital one. And this is why we fight so hard against the frailty of life and the brevity of life. It's why we yearn so much to be remembered. Now think about it. Think about all that we do, all that is out there in the 21st century to fight off old age. Think about it. I mean, just go to Walmart. You know, usually, you know, Carrie or the girl send me something over there in the cosmetic section, which I hate to go over in that section because every woman looks at me like, oh, you're transitioning or something, you know, and, and I really don't like that feeling. But, I'm, you know, I'm sitting there looking for something for acne or whatever, and everything, everything guarantees you you're going to look younger. Now, nothing promises me to get hair. I don't want hair. I, I had hair a long time ago. That ship sailed. I mean, all that we do to prevent us from looking the way we're supposed to look at our age. And all this so that we can look in the mirror and think that we're younger than we actually are. Or at least make others think we're younger than we actually are. I remember when I was in the Philippines, I was 23 years old, and somebody asked me if I was Carrie's dad. I've been asked that quite a bit over the years. So that we can actually lie to ourselves and say, I'm going to live forever. You idiot. We're not going to live forever. That's absolute futility. We're not turning back the clock, not one millisecond. Why is this? Why do we do that to ourselves? Because we're a mist. We're a mist in time and that haunts us. Because we have no answer to that question, what is your life? Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Does it even matter? What is my life? And if you take life's brevity plus life's frailty without being able to answer that question, then don't be surprised if you're currently experiencing life's futility. Solomon talks about this a lot in Ecclesiastes. We're a shadow, a candle, a mist. Regardless of what we own, regardless of all of our plans, regardless of all of our potential, if those questions cannot be answered, there is nothing. Nothing. Let me give you an example. This is an old example. Have you ever heard of this? <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't even know why I asked the question, but that's what I'm taught to do. Every, you ever hear of the second Earl of Rochester? And I don't mean the one in Illinois. <laughs> okay. Okay, if I tell you one of his sayings, maybe you remember this. One time he said he had six theory, he used to have six theories on parenting, but now he has six children and no theories. Okay. Maybe you remember that one, but Heather can relate to that one. Uh, but. He was very talented, brilliant, brilliant young man. He received the title of Earl at 10 years old. He went to Oxford when he was 12 and graduated when he was 14. So much potential, so much promise. At 18, he was imprisoned for abducting a rich woman. He was known for his debauchery and his sinful behavior and he died when he was 33 years old. All that potential, all that promise squandered because he died without ever finding out why it was that he lived. Until we find out how to die, we will never find out how we should live. And until we know how we should live, we'll never be ready to die. 
Now you can think about that over lunch. All right? Now James is not calling, now he's not calling us to a life of gloom either and morbidity. He's not saying that we should be morbidly thinking of our soon demise and being unhelpful to one another, not at all. And some of you might be you know, here this morning thinking, wow, Vance, this is really bringing us down. I wish you would stop so that I can get to the restaurant. Remember, I encourage you to stay in the moment. Because maybe there's people here today and you've been in one too many restaurants. And I don't mean anybody. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about me and Jeremy, okay? All right. But, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. The food doesn't taste as good anymore. It doesn't bring the pleasure that it once did. For some, it may be that your intellectual achievements don't really give you that buzz anymore. You might have thought, if I could get this degree or that degree, then, then, then I would be there. Then I would arrive. But that degree on the wall has gotten dusty, and it doesn't mean what it once did. I was looking at mine the other day, and I thought, all that work doesn't really mean nothing. Those three pieces of paper don't mean anything. I am the only person in the entire world with three degrees in missions, in intercultural studies. That used to just jolt me. Now, I don't mean nothing. I get what Paul talks about. It's all dung compared to knowing Christ. Or it might be you're here today and the material possessions that once made you feel so great has lost their luster. Maybe a house, a bike, a car, a boat, whatever. It might be you're here today and it was your children or your grandchildren, but now they've grown older and your frailty of the parent and your mortality is before you and you're just not ready to die. Better take care of business, Mr. Businessman, and find the answers to these questions James presents before it's too late. Now again, maybe you're saying here, you're saying, okay, Vance, I do, okay, I get it, I get it. I recognize what James is saying. I've been a big planner, I'm very organized. I prepared, I've even prepared my own funeral. But I don't have the answers to these questions. What is my life? Then I have two words for you, and this is the last part of the, the answer sheet. The word, first word is this, alienation. Alienation. The Bible says that the human problem, the human predicament, is directly tied to alienation. A word that we all should understand because we have all are alienated from people in some way. Maybe we're alienated from those we used to spend time with when we were younger. Maybe we're alienated from certain members of our family. Maybe we're alienated from certain cultures or communities or ethnicities based in economics or whatever. I don't know if you've ever been around people where they're all speaking a different language and you feel alienated because you cannot commu you know, communicate with them. Maybe you've been a you, you feel alienated as a result of finances or race or intellect. Maybe you feel alienated even from yourself because you can't even make sense of your own existence. I don't know if you, I mean, I'm sure everyone here remembers or knows the name Friedrich Nietzsche. It's a very famous name. You'll see his quotes all the time. He was known for all, I mean, all being so intelligent. But for all of his brilliance, for being so proud, so clever, so intelligent, but so unwilling to acknowledge the truth of God's word. He was always making fun of it, always criticizing it, always mocking it. Maybe that's you today. He spent the last 11 years of his life in a total mental collapse, total mental darkness under psychiatric care. And now that brilliant man is in hell. The Bible says God is the creator, that he made you and I, that God gave you all your abilities. He gave you your looks or the lack thereof. He gave you your opportunities. And whether you believe it or not, he has ordered your life right up to this moment, right now, right here. But you have a problem. You're alienated from God who made you. And from your end, you have no ability whatsoever to do anything about it. You cannot reestablish that relationship. You can't do it by good works. You can't do it by being nice. You can't do it by being kind. You can't do it by religious zeal or effort. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't inherit it. And it certainly, 
certainly doesn't lie within you. But there is really, really, really good news. That although we can't do it for ourselves, the same God from whom we are alienated has come to do it for us. Which brings us to our second word, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Your alienation from God is dealt with by his willingness to provide reconciliation to himself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son. And as strange as it may seem, as strange as it may sound, when we acknowledge that we are alienated from God, that we are his enemies, when we recognize that we are completely unable to do anything about our condition. And although we don't deserve it at all, God has chosen to offer reconciliation by placing our sin, our rebellion, on his son. And count them against Jesus, not against us. That if we will trust in Jesus... Faithfully follow Jesus, love him, obey him, serve him, then we can be reconciled back to God. But there's more. There's more. I mean, we're talking about the great exchange. My sin, his righteousness. But there's more. When reconciliation takes place with God through Jesus Christ, not only does it deal with the problem, the big problem of our alienation from God, But God also provides the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who gives us the ability to deal with all the other issues in our life that we face. I mean, the call of the Bible is to deal with the main problem of alienation from God first, and then with God's help, take care of all the rest. But if we don't deal with our alienation from God first, we'll never find the answer to the other problems of life. Christ took our place. He took our punishment. He took all that you and I deserve. And then he provides all that we don't deserve. And that truth, that only, only that truth enables our inability, that eliminates our inability, that eliminates our ignorance, our frailty, our brevity, And even eliminates our futility by answering the question, what is your life? Please stand. And I would like for you to bow your head and close your eyes.